Hey everybody, what is going on? Hexlex here. I got another Master of Duel video for you. So, uh, we are going to be doing yet another one of our tier lists for this season here. Uh, well, it's going to be kind of for this season and the next. So, uh, I wanted to talk about what I think the meta is going to look like, uh, not only now, but mostly we're going to be focusing on the post ban list meta. So, this will be a post ban list uh, sort of tier list that we got going on here. Um, I don't know that too much is going to change, uh, given the list. It'll mostly be some shuffling around of decks on the lower tiers as opposed to the upper ones. But I think we are in a very interesting meta right now. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize before I jump into this tier list, well, first, as always, as ever, uh, I have what I consider to be 50 of the top decks of the format. Now, just because I have these 50 decks doesn't mean I think these are the only good 50 decks. Um, I just think that, you know, these are a really good representation of what the top 50 decks in the Master Duel meta are. Uh, there are decks not featured here that are still uh, very capable of hitting Master and Master 1. Especially if your favorite deck isn't here. That's my favorite deck too. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, no, for real though. Uh, if a deck is not listed here, or if I put a deck in Rogue, I still think it's a fine deck. I've seen some people get really upset when I put a deck in Rogue here, as if I'm calling it bad. Let me preface by saying, any deck on this list, even the ones in Rogue, very capable of getting Master 1 uh, and topping or even winning tournaments with the correct uh, like skill level, slash pilot, so on and so forth. But uh, The other thing I want to mention specifically about this meta in particular is that the lines between Tier 1 and Tier 2 feel very blurred right now. Uh, this is one of those metas where a lot of things are viable. So... Um, just because a deck is like tier 2 doesn't mean it's like a whole lot weaker than tier 1. That's been the case in past metas, especially like tier 0 meta, right? Where tier elements were like the only tier 1 deck and they were far above everything else. But uh, I don't at all think that's the case here with this particular meta. So um, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start right here with Branded Despia. Wow, that's actually a very interesting deck to start with. Uh, Branded Despia. Hmm... It's interesting because it's one of those decks that, like, its power level is definitely, in my opinion, it is kind of noticeably, not decreasing, but, you know, everything else is, like, steadily increasing. And as time goes on, it does seem that Brand Despia is starting to fall a little bit further and further behind. But I don't think that it's a bad deck by any means, and I don't think it has been significantly uh, power crept at all. Uh, of course, it is going to get even more support. Still yet to come in Master Duel, and there's always the potential for new support with the Albaz lore kind of uh, up in the air for a sequel possibly, and it's a fan favorite, so it would make a lot of sense for it to come back. I think for me, and I might change my mind later in the tier list, but I think for now, for me, Brandon Despia is like going to be the bottom, I think, of tier 2. I think Brandon Despia might be a good litmus of what I think separates tier 2 and tier 3. Uh, I like to do this with the bottom of each tier. Like, I'll pick that deck and I'll be like, okay... If I think a deck is worse than this deck, I can go to the tier below and better in the tier above. Duh. But I think it does make a good litmus test. So Branded Despia, for now, again, might change my mind, but it's kind of like the tier 2 and tier 3 gatekeeper. I might even bring it down and put it at the top of tier 3 later, but um, right now my instinct wants to put it at the bottom of tier 2. So Dinos. Dinos are... Wait, where, where did they go? Oh, they went all the way over here. Good lord. Uh, Dinos are still a very good rogue deck. Uh, I will go ahead and end up putting them in rogue. Um, being a long-form combo deck, it does have its disadvantages in that it ends up being weak to a lot of different hand traps. Um, but that said, uh, the Dinosaur end board is still very scary, and Dinosaur has a number of ways to get there. So, very solid deck overall. Uh, I think the uh, definition of a rogue deck. Um, but again, I mean that in a good way. Uh, dinosaurs, if you like dinosaurs, and especially if you built them like when you first got into Master Duel, they've been a good investment because a lot of these rogue decks have been about the same power level for pretty much the entirety of the lifespan in Master Duel, even dating back into January 2022. And a lot of the time, and I wanted to point this out with Brandon Despia too, uh, a lot of the time when you see a deck actually winning tournaments, not just topping, but winning the whole thing, it's usually somebody that's very dedicated to their build. It's usually either a rogue deck or in my experience i see a lot of branded espia winning tournaments as well so um anyway endemian uh, another one of those rogue decks um i don't know how much better they get with future pendulum support like exceed the pendulum 
Um, but they're still a very, very solid deck. I think one of the things that holds them back, and oh, I hate how some of these images are askew. Hopefully that doesn't bother you too much, but um, anyway. Um, I think one of the things that holds it back in Master Duel in particular a lot, honestly, is the fact that you have to individually place, I don't know about place, I think it is place and remove, but I know at the very least you have to individually remove spell counters, so um, that actually ends up being very time consuming and, and makes it a little bit tricky sometimes to do your long combos that Endymion has, but. Um, yeah, I think I'll just put them right here in Rogue, a little bit above Dinosaur. Libromancer. Libromancer, also a Rogue deck. It has been coming up a little bit more often lately, but um, ultimately I think Libromancer is going to be uh, Rogue. I think it's coming up more often because the Secret Pack recently came out, so it's a, it's more accessible now. Um, it tends to be one of those fan favorite decks, right? Like, people who love Libromancer love Libromancer. It does have very fun theming, I will definitely admit. But uh, as far as its competitive viability... Um, among these decks on the tier list, this will rank lower down in Rogue, but again, Libromancer is still more than capable of seeing success on both flatter and tournaments with a skilled and or dedicated enough pilot. Uh, I've got Rex here to represent Fur Hire, usually in the form of like Runic Fur Hire Sprite. Now, like a lot of Runic variants, this one is going to suffer uh, in its tier list rating. I don't think I even had it on the last tier list, but I definitely should have as a Rogue deck. Um, but with the amount of success that the deck has been seeing lately, um, largely in part to um, my friend Beeps doing very well with it at recent uh, tournaments, uh, you know, we've been seeing enough of an increase of play and also just like skilled people using it that it, it definitely bumps up in Rogue, almost I think brushing on tier 3, but then of course we have the Runic Fountain to 1 limit, which... The thing about the Runic Fountain to 1 limit that's especially frustrating is that I see a lot of people saying like, Oh, it's good because now Runic Stun is worse. But of all the Runic variants, Stun actually suffers the least from Fountain going to one. Um, not only Runic Stun definitely needs the Runic cards the least of any of the Runic variants, but Stun in general can definitely just not play Runic and be totally fine still. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a shame that Fountain to one hurts a cool deck like for a higher Runic and, and uh, you know, other decks we'll talk about here shortly, but... Um, as far as where I think it ends up being on the tier list, uh, still Rogue. I don't know. I don't know if I can confidently say it's better than stuff like Endymion and Dinos anymore. Again, with Fountain at 2, I think, yeah, it's absolutely, like, upper Rogue for sure. If not, maybe even the bottom of tier 3. But, no, I, I think moving forward with Fountain at 1, it becomes a lot trickier. Like, not only because you see Fountain a little bit less often, but mostly because if they remove Fountain... It's just, you're just done. And it's not hard for a deck, especially in modern media, to banish a guard, right? Um, yeah, so, anyway. Um, a Rise Heart representing Kashira here. Uh, Kashira people, myself including, have been clowning on a lot lately as it uh, has definitely dropped hard. But I've said this a couple of times, I do think this is true. I think we've actually circled around to a point where now I think people are slightly underestimating Kashira as a whole. Like... Like, sure, the deck doesn't put up with the results that it definitely doesn't put up with the results that people hyped it up to. Um, and it doesn't get, like, the most amount of tournament results in the world. But you still see it around quite a bit. Um, I do think it is better than Despia, so I am going to put it in Tier 2. I think that's fair. I think Kashira is a Tier 2 deck. Uh, some people may argue that it's Tier 3 because of how little results it gets, but I would argue that... It's getting tier 3 level of results because the pendulum is again kind of swinging the opposite direction where before it was massively overplayed. Now, I'm not saying it's massively underplayed. I think it's slightly underplayed. Um, but I do think it's a tier 2 deck. I think it's a little bit, a little bit, not very much, but a little bit better than Branded Despia right now. Uh, Plunder Patrol. Plunder Patrol is another deck that actually used the Runic Engine quite often, um, but it's a little bit less hurt as a whole as an archetype with the Fountain Limit or by the Fountain Limit um, because Lab Plunder is still very much a thing. Basically, Plunder ends up being very susceptible to Ash Blossom, so it ends up being very good to pair it with other archetypes that are also very susceptible to Ash Blossom. Um, and Labyrinth also fiend locks you, but that's okay because the Plunder Patrols are all fiends. So, um, Lab ends up being another very natural fit for the deck. Uh, it's still very much a rogue deck. I'm going to put it, uh, I, you know, because of how well it can adapt as opposed to, you know, other runic variants, I think it will end up putting it above for higher. Um, it's definitely rogue, but it's, it's a pretty good deck overall. So, Thunder Dragons. Thunder Dragons are... I kind of like Dinos. I'll just end up putting them next to Dinos. Uh, I'll put Endymion a little bit higher than Thunder Dragons, though. Thunder Dragons is one of those 
it, it, it's not even just a good deck, it's also just a good versatile engine. You'll often see Thunder Dragon cards in like 60 card Chaos Pile decks. Um, but I think as Thunder Dragon as a deck, I'd put it around the same level as like Dinos and Endymion. It's one of those rogues decks, rogue decks that will uh, sneak into top cuts every now and then. And a good amount of the time it sneaks into a top cut, it will end up winning the whole thing as I touched on earlier. So uh, Next up we have Teller Knights, uh, which is Constellar, Teller Knights, just Teller Knights as a whole. Uh, obviously got a recent boost about like almost two months ago now, I think, something like that. But I just haven't been seeing it that much. Uh, I think I'm going to end up putting it down here. Um, I think it's... I don't know. I don't know how underrepresented it actually is. It's one of those decks that's kind of like Liebermancer in the regard that like it does cool things and it does good things. But are the cool things that it does good enough? And it's, it's like, you know, a lot of decks, especially in Yu-Gi-Oh! right now, which I will say this isn't even a bad thing necessarily, I think this is actually kind of a strength in the current meta. There are a lot of decks that aren't bad, they're just not quite good enough, right? Um, or you might want to say it like, you know, decks like Liebermancer and like Teller Knight are fair. They're good, but fair, in that they don't do like super ridiculous things. Um, but they make pretty good plays. Uh, it's just that other decks can make less fair and also good plays, as in uh, they can spit out bigger boards for less commitment, play through more disrupts just more naturally. That's stuff like that. That's kind of what I mean when I say fair versus unfair. So, uh, yeah, I think Teller Knights falls into the good but fair category. Uh, Spiral. Spiral is a definitely a rogue deck. I definitely usually put it pretty close to, if not right next to Endymion, pretty much every single time, um, because I think they're pretty comparable in a lot of ways, right? Uh, they're long-form combo decks that when they go unchecked, uh, or if they get disrupted at the wrong points, um, can very easily just run away with the game. But um, sometimes, not always, like, it's not like you have to have, like, super specific hands. I was gonna say sometimes you need, uh, it's not even, like, needing to open certain cards, but when I say you need certain cards for things to go well, you need them to just resolve in general. So, um, it's also, like, maxi. Like, I don't know, I, I kind of hesitated because what I'm gonna say sounds like I'm saying maxi keeps combo decks in check. I'm not saying that's the case, I don't think that's a good argument, but Maxi, the existence of it, you can't deny, does make it more difficult for long form combo decks to see more consistent play. Now again, Maxi does not single handedly keep combo decks quote unquote in check. Um, for one, I think that term means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and two, I just again gen generally don't think that's a very good argument for like the existence of Maxi and Master Duel. But, um, you can't deny that, yeah, decks like Spiral and Endymion would be at least a little bit easier to play uh, if Maxi wasn't around. But anyway, Evil Eye, Evil Eye, that rogue deck that somehow always is a f above 50% win rate uh, every time we get the usage and win rate statistics for Master Duel. But I've talked about this a couple of times before. I think a lot of the reason that this ends up being the case is because Evil Eye is one of those decks that has a lot of searchers, but those searchers all, not all, but generally will tend to search the same cards, right, that you need anyway, so using Ash or Imperm or something like that to stop one search doesn't mean you stop their combo line, and a lot of people don't necessarily realize that. I'm not saying I know how to counter Evil Eye, because I definitely don't, but I think Evil Eye has a high win rate, because the few people who play it not only know how to play it well, um, but also because so few people play it, there's just generally that not that much knowledge about the deck. But uh, definitely a rogue deck. I'll put it like, I don't know, I'll put a little bit of a plunder. Why not? I think that's about right for Evil Eye, somewhere in that neighborhood. Subterra Guru, quote unquote, control. <laughs> uh, it's funny, Subterra Guru as well as Yumi stuff, which I'll kind of talk about these in like the same breath, because I think they're about the same place on the tier list. People call these both control decks, but like, come on, they're, they're, they're just stun decks most of the time. Especially Yumi Control is actually a pretty big, like, perpetrator in this, because people will say, well, like, oh, well, you don't necessarily play Floodgates, and it's like, your deck revolves around Kairu Shin, which is literally, there can be only one on legs. Like, you play a Floodgate deck, <laughs> which is fine. Like, I also want to preface, like, I'm not, like, ha-ha laugh at the filthy Floodgate players, but, like, I don't know, it's like... 
I think the clarification, the classification is just, it's mostly a for fun thing, for fun comments I make. I don't, I don't actually hate you if you play Yumi decks, you know, whatever, anything like that. But, um, I think these are like fairly comparable to something like Evil Eye. I don't know though, do I, do I really think that like for a higher runic with Fountain at one is worse than stuff? So I, I do actually. Like, Fountain of One is a pretty big blow. Like, it doesn't make the deck super unplayable, but it's not a good time. Also, if you're thinking about future metas when SP Little Knight comes out, it gets so much worse for Runic, because then, like, literally every deck has access to a Link 2 that can just banish their one at Fountain, and then it's just, like, over. Then it's just super Jover. Then I think we don't even put Runic on the tier list anymore, but, yeah, for now, I guess I'll keep it down there. But, um, yeah, Guru Control, quote-unquote Control... This one does usually just play like trap card floodgates, although not necessarily all the time, but a lot of the time. I think these decks are fairly comparable in their power level and also how they play. I'll put them about here on Rogue. Uh, Sky Striker, Sky Striker. I'll put an upper Rogue because this this deck has been seeing a noticeable uptick in play, um, mostly thanks to Triple Tactics Thrust. Uh, being a huge piece of support for this deck, and it's not like this deck ever like went away, but you know it, it's you know for a long time with, with the shufflers, you know I said you know like three times in a row there, uh, with the shufflers being around, uh, tier limits seeing a lot of play as a result, bestials being around a lot, um, it just ended up being pretty hard for Sky Striker during those metas, but now there's less of that generally happening overall, although there's still a decent amount of bestials like. Sky Striker can play through getting their Ray Banished a lot of the time. That's that's fine, but um, it was mostly the Shuffle was putting back a lot of spells that really hurt. Yeah, Sky Striker Upper Rogue deck. I played it recently. I was pretty impressed by it. I think it's a good deck. Bird Up recently got their third Cobalt Sparrow back, which um, I've had people say uh, that Optimal Bird Up lists do actually play three Cobalt Sparrows, so that is a nice little boost of power to the Tri Bird. Uh, Tri-Bird. Tri-Bird Adelir Lesk Bird Up deck is what I meant to say. I'll put it in Upper Oak. I think the deck is probably underplayed, but maybe with the Cobalt Sparrow going back up to three, uh, more people will tune in to the deck, and, um, yeah, I might even try it myself here in the future. We'll see. But, um, Dino Morphia. I was actually surprised when I was looking at Master Duel meta. Usually I'll look over the top decks that are being submitted just to make sure I'm not forgetting or missing anything. Um, I was surprised to see how many Dynamorphia decks are being submitted lately, but I think like Sky Striker, this makes sense if you think about Triple Tactics Thrust, um, especially for Dynamorphia, right? Like, because you're looking for normal trap cards, you can use the Thrust more versatilely uh, more often. Like, the cards you really want to set are going to be the ones that you can set turn one without your opponent having to have a monster on the field anyway, so... Um, I'm not a Dynamorphia expert, maybe I'm wrong, but I imagine it is Thrust that is causing this to see a little bit of a boost in play. I'll put Dynamorphia, like, um, like, yep, yeah, I think somewhere in this neighborhood is fine. I guess I'll put it next to Dinos, why not, sure. Trap Tricks, Trap Tricks, I'll put kind of like, uh, somewhere in this neighborhood. I think it ends up being, like, a slightly better Trap Deck than Dynamorphia. Uh, because it can play a little bit more slowly, it plays better into like disruption. Dynamorphia is a little bit, a little bit more comboy uh, than something like Trap Tricks. Although Trap Tricks can also definitely be comboy. It's just a little bit more versatile in its game plan, um, and just slightly higher power level cards overall. Trap Tricks Sarah, very, very good Link One monster. But um, yeah, Upper Rogue I think is a pretty good spot for it. Uh, Marine Sis. Marine Sis, I'll continue to put here in, like, mid-upper rogue. Um, yeah, I think that's a good spot for it. I've had people tell me that, like, Aqua Argonaut Pass is actually not that bad, um, which I can definitely see it. Um, I think generally the meta is a little bit more prepared for towers overall, but I definitely don't think that makes the deck bad by any stretch of the imagination, so. Alright, next up is Sword Soul Tenny. Sword Soul... I don't remember if I put it on tier 2 last time, I think I did, but I think we are finally at the time where we're going to put Sword Soul on tier 3, if I haven't already, <laughs> which I think I might have actually, but yeah, I think the time has finally come. Uh, Sword Soul is just very slowly getting power crept, or has been slowly getting power crept, but uh, with Monodium having leaked, been leaked to come out relatively recently, you know, that is just going to directly power creep sword soul as like a mid-range style synchro deck i think it's more mid-range quote-unquote mid-range but um i don't think it has like huge combos all the time 
Uh, but I would need to do more research before speaking confidently about how that deck plays. But going the conjecture I've heard and what other people I know have said, um, yeah, Monadium, which is going to come out very soon, will definitely power creep Sword Soul. So I think it's like the top of Tier 3, but it is a Tier 3 deck now, which is a little bit sad to see. But uh, of course, Tier 3, as I mentioned before, does not mean it's bad by any means. And because I know I've recommended investing in Sword Soul for new players um, a decent amount of time on the channel. I think that is still the case. It's still a good deck. It'll still teach you good fundamentals of modern Yu-Gi-Oh! And it still rewards you for learning the deck uh, because people who can play decks like this well can still see a lot of success with them. So, yeah, I think it's a good spot. Uh, tier Limit. Tier Limit? I don't know. This is actually pretty difficult. This might actually be the top. Well, no, I'll put it like right under Sword Soul. I think it's pretty close to being the top of Tier 3. I think Tier Limit comes pretty close to Ethan brushing into Tier 2, but I do think that Branded Espia and Sword Soul are both still very slightly better than it, so I'll put it here. Um, the thing that mostly holds Tier Limit back is just how, oh, not a lot of the time, but sometimes you do kind of rely on milling the Shiren uh, or Havness, not even just for your initial plays, but even later into your plays. Um, but Tier Limit still has a lot of good milling effects. like. They can still mill 8 with, like, Kekolo spring back Tier Limits, uh, uh, Cash Shira, which was, which would have milled to if it was sent to the graveyard, right? So, um, in that regard, you know, the deck is definitely not, like, dead or anything, for sure. Um, it's close. It's really close to being Tier 2, much like Sword Soul, but I'm gonna have put it just under Sword Soul towards the top of Tier 3. I think it's a good spot for it. Uh, Mikanko. Mikanko has fallen off uh, in terms of representation. I just haven't been seeing it much lately, uh, both personally on ladder and in terms of decks submitted like to, you know, Master Duel meta. Uh, I definitely don't think the deck is bad. I have in the past put it in Tier 3, but I think for this tier list, I'm going to use this as my, like, rogue gatekeeper. I think Mikanko... Mostly because, again, it's just not seeing as much representation, is, like, very barely not a Tier 3 deck. So I think it's probably the top of Rogue, and I think for now I'm going to keep it right up there. Uh, Gishki Sprite, I think, is a very similar story to Makanko, and I'm going to put it directly under Makanko. Um, it's one of those decks that I think if it just saw enough play, it would be a very solid Tier 3 deck. Like, Sprite as a whole... It's weird, because I'm going to talk about separate sprite variants a little bit here. Sprite as a whole, I would put in Tier 3, um, if you count and group all its variants together. But like I said, I'm going to talk about the variants separately as well. And the Gishki variant, again, I think is underplayed, but I'll put it towards Upper Rogue. I, I might put it under, like, Sky Striker, but eh, it's close, you know? It's very close between the two. I'll leave it up here, but I do think Makanku is, like, slightly better. Uh, speaking of another deck you can compare directly to Makanko, uh, in more ways than you could Gishki Sprite, is Numeron. With Gishki Sprite, we're just comparing their, like, relative power level. Um, but with Numeron, you know, it and Makanko want very much the same thing, except for the fact that Numeron is super duper linear about how it does it. Makanko has a lot of flexibility in what it can do and a lot more insulation for its plays. Numeron just does one thing, and if it can do it, it wins, and if it can't, it doesn't. Numeron's gonna be at the bottom of Rogue, I think. This is like, um, you know, I'm not saying decks that are not featured here are worse than Numeron, but Numeron is just one of those decks where, like, you know, yeah, if due to the nature of best of one, you can just sneak in wins with it, um, but it's just uh, very one track in what it does. So, as a result, it ends up being. Um, difficult to see a lot of consistent success with. Or if you do want to see consistent success, you have to dump a lot of time into using it. So, anyway. Um, Pearly. Ooh, Pearly is going to be the next deck we talk about here. I think Pearly is a definite tier 1 deck for sure. Um, I don't think that's a very controversial statement in the slightest. I think that Pearly is still the best deck of the meta. However, however... I do think it's much less close than it has been in the past, like even in very recent tier lists, like even the last one. And it wasn't like super duper far in a way the best deck before either. Um, I think it's a little more contentious and, or debatable as to what exactly is the best deck of the current meta right now. Um, 
just due to the nature of the card pool in the meta, I think we are actually in a pretty good format in terms of diversity. Uh, that's what in, that's what makes it difficult to say what uh, exactly is the best deck right now. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily controversial to think that Pearly is the best deck. Uh, I think post ban list. So that, I, I want to. I should have actually prefaced with this. That's before. There. That's before the ban list. Post ban list. Post ban. I think Pearly is still a tier one deck. Uh, Delicious becomes a little bit less consistent, not only drawing it less, but of course not getting a guaranteed search off of it from my friend. But, um, you know, as far as like finding plays, the Pearly player can still often do it. And it's like, even if you don't get Delicious, you'll still get a different quick play spell, which will be able to find you uh, the regular Pearly if you've already used the my friend or the um, Pearlily to find the my friend. Um, you know, it's just going to be more hand dependent, but uh, I think overall Pearly is still a tier one deck. So as far as if I think it's going to be the best deck, like in a post banless meta, that I'm slightly less sure of. I think the answer might be yes, but uh, it'll be contentious with some other decks that are on this tier list that we're going to see later. But uh, I do think with Delicious and Pearly at two, the deck is still tier one. Uh, Exosister is going to be the next deck we talk about. It's been rogue for quite a while. I mean, the last time this deck was arguably tiered was uh, back when Tier Limit was reigning as the undisputed Tier 1 deck, but now definitely a rogue deck. I think pretty comparable to stuff like Thunder Dragon and, and Marine Sis. Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit better than, than them. I don't know. Like, maybe I'll put it, like, right here. It's like, yeah, just somewhere in this general neighborhood. Um... Akitama, uh, Akitama, I was good. I, that was me combining Aratama and Sakitama. Sakitama being the new card that's come out recently that's given Exos a little bit of a boost in power. Maybe I do put them above stuff like Spiral and Endemian. I, I think that's the case. I think Spiral and Endemian are definitely like the definition of mid rogue, or maybe these are like the border between mid and upper rogue, right? Uh, and Exo definitely ends up being a, a very solid rogue deck overall. Sakitama did boost it in power level. I think. I think I was thinking of the deck pre-Sakitama when putting it down here. Post-Sakitama, it's more like up here. And, yeah, I mean, it's decent, but... Uh, Drytron. Drytron's a deck I haven't talked about in quite some time, but it's a pretty solid deck. Um, I think it's probably somewhere in the, like, Evil Eye, Dino Morphia neighborhood, where it's like... I think it's like a mid-rogue, where... Um, at this point, you know, dedicated pilots will be the ones still playing it and seeing success with it. Um, oh, I remember the change. I was trying to think of, like, if there was a new card that came out that helped it. But no, it's the, uh, it was the recent banless change of Ben 10 going to 3 that kind of made it see a little bit of a boost in play. So, um, yeah, cool. Good for them. Uh, they get to have their Ben 10s a little bit more often. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think they're still just a, a pretty decent rogue deck overall. So with Sprite, I'm going to talk a little bit about both Pure Sprite and Sprite overall. So uh, Pure Sprite did see some success in the Duelist Cup Top 100. However, I don't really think I can use that as evidence necessarily uh, by itself that Pure Sprite is any better than decks that didn't appear at all in the Duelist Cup Top 100 because I've talked about this in uh, context with Runic Stun. But it applies to gigantic, or gigantic, to pure sprite as well, right? The fact that Duel's Cup Top 100 meta favors decks that can end games quickly more, just more in general, because you want to get a lot of points really quickly. Pure sprite has a lot of OTK lines between uh, Gamma Burst, between Cat Shark, between Mosquito. So in that regard, it ended up seeing success in the Duel's Cup, I think, mostly due to that. Um... I think Sprite is like the bottom of tier 3, uh, and I, now I'm talking about Sprite a little bit more as a whole. Again, we talked about Gishki Sprite separately, uh, as we'll maybe talk about... I'm trying to see if there are actually other Sprite variants on here. There might not be actually, but I think Sprite as a whole is like the bottom of tier 3, right? I do think it's slightly underplayed. I think the overall hits to the deck have kind of deterred people from playing it, but I don't think those hits have made it unplayable by any means, and I don't think they've even made the deck weak by any means. Uh, it just means that Sprite is mostly an engine now, and as an engine, I'm going to put it at the bottom of tier 3. Pure Sprite as a deck, 
I personally would probably put it at the bottom of tier three, but it's probably more correct to put it in like upper rogue. But again, I'm gonna put Giganticon here as an overall representation of Sprite as an engine. And between all its variants, um, even with Runic Sprite not really being a thing, with uh, Fountain going to one, I think overall it is still, yeah, bottom tier three. I think that's fair to say. I don't think too many people would disagree with that, so. Uh, let's see, no, no Veles. Oh, no Veles. Uh, this deck is really cute, but it's just, it's frankly not, like, the best. It's it's a fine deck. You can definitely still see some, some success with it, but... One thing I thought that was kind of funny was, uh, during the Ritual Festival, right? By the end of it, I was so done with it. I was like, I'm just gonna play to get my Destroyer card missions. I literally just played 40 normal spells that said destroy a card. I'm talking like Fissure, Smashing Ground, Lightning Vortex, that kind of stuff. I just wanted to destroy cards. Funnily enough, I played two games against Novelace to finish that whole mission, right? And those two games lasted 9 turns and 17 turns, respectively. Keep in mind, I wasn't even playing, like, trap cards. I was not. I was only playing 40 normal spells that destroy cards, and funnily enough, Novelis apparently has a bit of a time dealing with that. Like, um, they would really only be able to summon one small monster per turn, and I think it's because I was playing, like, Fissures and Smashing Grounds and stuff that didn't target specifically, right? But I just thought that was funny, that, like, I was sitting here doing nothing but playing these one-for-one -one destruction spells, and I'm like, what's going on? Can this deck really not kill me? And apparently they couldn't, so... It was a little funny there, but anyway, it's still a solid deck. I think it's a good deck, but uh, let me take a sip of water here. And now we'll talk about Black Wings. Um, Black Wings, I just, God, I haven't seen this deck in forever. <coughs> Excuse me. But I think it's a fine deck. I will put it, uh, I'll put it down here with like Teller Knights and Novelle says like, Solid deck, diehard player, diehard fan, could definitely do well with it. Um, but overall, its power level is just, it's just fair, right? Like, Novelace is fair, Libromancer is fair, Teller Knights are fair. Um, these are good but fair decks. Everything else that's better than it is just a little bit more unfair, honestly. A little to a lot, but anyway. Uh, stun is stun is stun is stun is stun is stun. Funnily enough, I, and this is another thing about Runic Fountain Hit that I didn't even point out in that video, but I talked about it earlier in this video, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, the, the Runic Fountain to one hit, people were like, it's good because it hurts Stun. But again, of the Runic variants, Stun is hurt the least by that hit. Stun as a whole could also not play Runic and just still be fine. So, yeah, I think there can be only one. Really needs to uh, go to one, which is also a flavor fail that card is not at one, but... I digress. Um, Stun... I don't know, it's kind of comparable to Yumi Control and Guru Control, but I think it's a little bit... I think, like, very, like vanilla, quote-unquote, Stun is, like, a little bit worse than those. Where do I want to put it? Like, do I think Stun is better than, like, Libramancer and Novelis? I think it is. I think very slightly. I would not be surprised if Sun had a slightly higher win rate than these two decks. That would, yeah, that would not surprise me overall. So, I'll put Sun right here. And again, this could be Runic Sun, or this could just be straight up Sun. I think that Yumi Control, quote unquote Control, and Guru, quote unquote Control, are better flavors of it when they play Floodgates because they have like an engine, more of a backbone to go on. Whereas, like, regular Sun is just relying on the pot of cards as you're getting limited more and more. And, like, card Edomites and stuff like that. And, like, Moon Mirror Shield. So, yeah, I, th I think I'll put it here. I think it's about fine. So, I'm going to use this uh, to represent not only Code Talkers, but, like, Cyber Spiles in general. Ooh, actually, where do I want to put these? This is a really interesting choice because... I think I'm also going to lump Attic Nister into here, and when I keep that in mind, I want to put it in Tier 3. 
I'm gonna put Cybers piles in general. Again, this could be like the 60 card, every Cybers card ever kind of thing. Uh, this could be the Ignister pile. Uh, this is basically this is basically any cyber stack that ends on like the firewall brothers right like vanilla firewall singularity and or dark fluid um or heat soul or a bunch of stuff like that right that's kind of what i'm getting at with this representation and i think it's fair to put that kind of archetype of deck in tier three uh, with the recent cyber support singularity is huge the firewall cards are huge the firewall brothers like i said uh you love to see them together so yeah, I'll put it. I'll put it in there um, for just the cyber stuff in general. Valence. I actually haven't seen this deck around in forever uh, either. Funnily enough, it also plays like fossil land and stuff. But I do think it's better than stun or the f other floodgate decks or stuff like that. I'll put it like in this neighborhood with like Dino Morphia and regular dinos and Evil Eye and and Marine stuff like that. I think that's fair. Drytron might also be a little bit better than some of this stuff. I might put Drytron like around here. I think that's fair too. Okay. Runic. Um, this will be a little bit all encompassing, but we'll still talk about like Naturia Runic separately. But Runic as a whole, like, of course, with Fountain going to one, is very much hurt by it. Um, I think Runic as a whole, with Fountain at two, was like somewhere in this neighborhood of being upper rogue, which I don't think a deck needs to get hurt as hard as this deck only being having uh, one fountain if it's in this power level. But apparently that's just me. And a lot of people have made comparison to other cards that are lower power level that I and people as a whole have been more fine with being hit. But those are cards like Bishbalkin, Mass Driver, um, Cyframe Lord Omega, these are cards, uh, Rongo Minad, these are cards that facilitate FTKs, hand loops, or other non-game states. Now, people will argue that Runic facilitates a non-game state, but I don't think that's true at all to the degree of other cards like Bish, Rongo, um, Mass Driver, cards like those, because here's the thing, right? Those decks interact far less than Runic. Runic has this rep reputation for being uninteractive, which I don't understand at all. Runic literally can't mill you without interacting with your cards. In fact, known strategy against Runic, um, certain variants of it, like Pure and Stun, you can just play no cards at all until you get your outs to their Floodgates and or Fountain or stuff like that. And if you play zero cards at all, Runic will not be able to do anything other than summon Hugin. They can only do the instant fusion effects because all of their milling effects, all of their other effects, require you to have cards on the field. Slumber is Slumber and Tip. Those are the only ones they can still do. But, yeah. Um, I've talked at length already about how I feel about Fountain to 1. I think with Fountain at 1, it's it looks very bleak for Runic. I just gotta put it overall down next to, like, the Plunder variant. Or not the Plunder variant, necessarily, but the, um... What's it called? The uh, Fur Hire variants. I think the Fur Hire variants, more than pure, has more of a chance of seeing play. And maybe the Fur Hire variant, maybe, okay, maybe Plunder goes above these two. And maybe so does the Fur Hire variant. But for Runic as a whole, for Runic Pure, whatever you want to call this, it just does not look good. And again, as I mentioned before, SP Little Knight, literally every deck can banish to one of Fountain, and then Runic is just terrible. It's just not even worth playing at that point. Because they will only have one of their field spell. But anyway, Rescue Ace. Uh, Rescue Ace's future support still hasn't been announced, but that does not mean it's a bad deck by any means. In fact, it's a very solid deck. I would put Rescue Ace in its current iteration. I think, honestly, its current power level is somewhere in this neighborhood. Uh, kind of with, like, Marines' Drytron Thunder Dragon, like, around here, this area of Rogue. I think Rescue Ace is mostly underplayed right now because people are just waiting for the future support before committing to the deck, which I think is fair, but um, I think it's a little bit underrepresented. A very solid rogue deck overall right now. Dogmatica. I've had, I think, the last couple of tier lists people comment about no Dogmatica. Last time I thought, I genuinely thought I had Dogmatica on the tier list. Um, it's a solid enough deck. Was kind of surprised I didn't see it more in the Ritual Festival, to be honest, but 
Um, yeah, I think I'll put it around like this neighborhood with like Black Wings and Teller Knights. It's a pretty good deck. Do I actually think Runic is better than these decks? I don't think it is, actually. I think it might still be better than Novalis and Libromancer moving forward, but yeah, it's, um, it looks bleak. But Dogmatica, I think, is a fine deck. I'll put it like here, mid to lower rogue. Mudulce, I'll put pretty much around the exact same area, right? Um, no, I think Dogmatica might be slightly, slightly better than Mudulce, but yeah, overall mid to lower rogue, fine deck. Pen to Magician. Pen Magician is definitely more in the neighborhood of like Endemion, Spiral, Thunder Dragon, Exosister, uh, mid to upper rogue, being one of those decks that, much like a lot of the decks up here, uh, have been about this power level for the entirety of Master Duel's lifespan because they're just very solid decks overall. Uh, Salomon Gray I'll also put up here. Normally, I would actually put it a little bit lower, but it has actually seen some uh, pretty recent boost in power, of course, due to the recent overall boost in power for Cyrus cards as a whole. Um, Salomon Great sees more play as an engine, and Salad does have future support coming out, which will make it noticeably better, so definitely be on the lookout for that. I know I will be, because it looks pretty cool. Photon Galaxy has definitely dropped off hard since the deck first came out. Um, it had a good bit of hype behind it, but I think that was mostly new deck hype. I don't really even see that many, like, Photon Galaxy, you know, stands out there. I think it's appropriate to put it down here. You know, like all these other decks, solid. Maybe a bit underrepresented, but mostly just a firmly rogue deck. Ninjas are definitely more upper rogue. I'm definitely going to put them more, like, up here. Um, ninjas also, I've said this a lot about Flanderies, but having played against this deck a couple of times in the past week, ninjas might actually be my new least favorite deck to play against. Um... The Geo, the Gravity Ninja, gold, good old Geo Biden, probably one of my least favorite cards in the current Master Duel meta. Um, I complain about it every time I come up against the deck on stream, um, and I'll say it here too. I think being able to flip cards face down and never flip them up is a really dumb effect. Like, you could really achieve the same effect and be a lot more fair if you said, can't be flipped up until the end of your opponent's next turn, or something like that. Or like, because even just slipping them face down as a disrupt is often, you know, bad enough in itself. But the fact that you just can't ever flip the cards face up for any reason, like ever, is awful. I hate it. I absolutely despise it. Um, but the deck is fine overall. <laughs> it's a good deck. Labyrinth. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Labyrinth did also take a quote unquote hit on this ban list, but it was Stovey from three to two, which is like whatever, completely fine. I mean, obviously they would prefer to have three Stovey, but it's definitely not a high impact hit at all. I think Lab is probably still slightly weaker than Pearly. Hmm. I kind of hesitate to say that. I could easily see a world where this is correct. But the thing is, even pre banlist I'm not convinced Lab is necessarily Tier 1. It might be the top of Tier 2. Um, but I think it's probably the bottom of Tier 1. But it's close. So, yeah. Uh, I don't think... I mean, both decks are taking hits. And Pearly is definitely taking more of a hit. But I think Pearly overall might be enough of a higher power. I don't know, actually. It's really close between those two. I could see it. I could see either being correct. I'm going to leave it like this, but I think right now I'm kind of thinking of these two as like just about equal in terms of power level. And I do think they're still both about tier one decks, even post ban list. Naturia Runic. Uh, it's just, again, Fountain to one is pretty rough. I'll put it here next to Fur Hire. Runic, I think it is going to be slightly better moving forward, but I will say I think the deck has a better chance with Fountain at 1 than the Sacred Tree at 1 like it is in the TCG, but it's just not looking super great overall. Maybe uh, maybe a new Naturia variant will come of it. Um, I have Wool Crickets, I just haven't used them in a while because I, I think Runic's a snooze fest. I never played the deck, but um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how Naturia adapts. Nature finds a way and all that fun stuff. So, 
Scareclaw. Scareclaw variants are definitely still tier 3, and I think they're very, very solid decks overall. I don't know, they like definitely border on tier 2, but I don't necessarily think Scareclaw is better than Sword Sword Tier Limit. I think they're close. I think these three decks are pretty much roughly the same power level, but I'll go ahead and leave them in this order right here. Um, and I, the more I'm going on, I'm, the more confident I'm feeling about Brain of Despia being the bottom of tier 2, the gatekeeper into tier 2. I think, yeah, if you're a better deck than Brain of Despia, then you're tier 1 or 2. But if you're worse, you're tier 3 or rogue. I think that's fine. So, yeah, Scareclaw, Adventure Scare, very good deck. I guess with Monadium coming out, Monadium also uses Scareclaw stuff, so that might be yet another boost in power. There's just going to be more Vices support in general, probably. So, we might see Scareclaw still get even stronger yet, but... Um, I think tier 3, right snug in the middle for now, is a pretty good spot. Hero is going to be one of those upper rogue decks, um, pretty much alongside... Yeah, I think Burn Up might be a little bit high here. I'll put it down here, but... Yeah, I think Hero is definitely one of those upper rogue decks that's been upper rogue for, again, since January 2022, the entirety of Master Duel's lifespan. Um, I'll keep it right around here. I think that's fair. Okay, Vanquish Soul. This is, uh, this is one of the ones that I really wanted to talk about, so... Vanquish Soul is at a very, very interesting place right now. And I think of all of the decks on the tier list, this one is like the most contentious as far as how good people think it is. Um, I anticipated that it would come in as a tier 3 deck. I have definitely been mistaken about that. I slightly underestimated maybe even a little bit more than slightly underestimated what Vanquish Soul is capable of, because the effects read, and even when you play against the, the deck, it doesn't feel like they're doing a whole lot. But at the same time, they do have high-impact plays. They're just kind of a... They're a very interesting, they're like a combo control deck, which I think is pretty cool in that regard. Like, they definitely win through grinding you out via advantage and or burning you, but, like, they still play, like kind of combo-y. They're just interesting. They're a very interesting deck. Hmm. Oh, where am I going to place them, though? Okay, you know what? We have six decks left. Three of them are going to be tier one or two, and they're going to be a little bit difficult to place, because they're... Again, the line between tier one and two is so blurred right now. Blurred right now. So let's start with the three that are not tier one or two that I think are going to be easier to place here. Um, let's see. Flanderese, I'll start with that, is an upper rogue deck. I'll put it like just below Makonko. You still see it quite a bit and it still sees a good amount of success. But Mpen really needs to come. I, I might even be. No, I don't think it's worse than any of those other decks. Despite being upper rogue, I think Empen still needs to come back to three, or at least two. Like, come on. Map could also... Empen and Map could definitely both be at two, and the deck would absolutely be fine. And they could be at three, and the deck would be tier three for sure, but definitely still fine as well. Um, I think Empen, at the very least, could come back to two. We'll see if Konami wants to ease up on their bird hate, but I kind of doubt they will. Rika Sun Avalon, I will put in tier 3, but I'll put it more towards the bottom. I just, I don't know a lot about this deck, and I think it's probably underrepresented, much like Sprite is. So, I'll keep it down here, um, which I think is fair. And I think, ugh, what about Punk? I don't know, Punk is like, I put Punk in tier 3 a lot, but Punk is honestly probably a rogue deck. Yeah, I'm gonna put Rogue. I'm gonna put Rogue. I'm gonna put Punk down here in Rogue. I really would like to put it in Tier Three, but like I'm looking at the stuff in Tier Three, like Sprite. I don't necessarily think Punk as a whole is better than Sprite as a whole. I think Sprite variants see slightly more success, and or overall probably slightly. They're very comparable. I don't know. They're very comparable, and I think Makanko is fine sandwiched between them because I think its power level is also comparable to these two decks as a whole. Yeah, I think that's a fine spot for it. Okay, so you've probably all been waiting for these three decks in particular. Let's start with Mathmech. Mathmech, I definitely do think is a tier one deck, and I think it's better than Lab. Do I think it's better than Pearly is the question post ban list? Because Mathmech does only have one diameter, but 
that really only matters for the grind game, and it only matters sometimes. I think with Diameter being at one, the Firewall package in particular becomes a lot better, because now you have less inherent normal summons. The Spirit package also becomes... You can make the same argument for the Spirit package, too, um, because they also are reliant on normal summons. I don't know. These are going to be bandless changes that we really have to play out to feel the effects of. Mostly Delicious going to two. <sighs> this is so close. Okay. <laughs> Maybe slight bias. I'm going to put Mathmec above Pearly, but I think much like Pearly and Lab, I think all three of these decks are super close in terms of their power level, right? I don't know. Can I really... <sighs> I'm kind of wondering now if Lab shouldn't be the top of tier 2. I don't know. I don't know. But with Pearly... I don't know. Oh, God. It's so close. Because here's the thing. Now there's Vanquish Soul to think about. And Dragon Link. Like, you could make arguments... These are the really two difficult ones. Like, I'll put Mathmec at the top of tier 1 post ban list. But I really do think these three decks are, like, comparable power level. Vanquish Soul and Dragon Link, it's more difficult to say. I think Dragon Link is probably better than Vanquish Soul. And I do think it's a tier one. Okay, I'm going to do it like this. Here's how I'm going to do it. But as I mentioned at the very top of the video, the lines, this line between tier one and two is so blurred right now. Like, I could see somebody placing Vanquish Soul here, and I wouldn't even disagree with that. I could see this being the case, and I wouldn't disagree with that. I could see somebody doing something like this, and I wouldn't inherently disagree with that either. But I think I'm going to leave it like this, because I think the gap between Dragon Link and Lab and Vanquish Soul is a little bit more noticeable than the, than the gaps between any of the other Tier 1 decks. Because, again, I mean, this is true of, like, every deck. You can, like, disrupt it, and then they don't have plays, but... I don't know. I feel like that happens to Vanquish Soul maybe a little bit more often. Because, like I kind of mentioned, sometimes it feels like Vanquish Soul isn't doing a lot, and sometimes they don't really end up doing a whole lot. But at the same time, it's pretty easy for... I don't know. Vanquish Soul, I feel like, is one of those decks where it so depends how they open, right? Maybe more so than other archetypes. Like, the power of their plays is so dependent on how well they open. But I also have not played the deck, so I think it's also more difficult for me personally to place because I have less experience with it overall. So, I think I'm going to leave things here. And definitely feel free to disagree with me. Um, just don't be rude about it. Like, sometimes I see very rude comments disagreeing on the tier list. D don't, don't be like that. Um, I mentioned this in the last tier list video, but, like, discourse is fun, rudeness is not. So, we'll just keep that in mind as we're commenting, please. But, um, yeah, no, I think this is a fine representation of how I feel about the post ban list meta. Um, and while I do have Mathmec at the top with Pearly here, again, I think that the, these, all these tier 1 decks and Vanquish Soul, all five, the top five decks here, are all, like, super duper close in power level. Uh, Vanquish Soul, I definitely vastly underestimated. Again, I thought it was going to be like a mid-tier 3 deck when it came out. Not at all. It's tier 2, and again, very easily could see an argument and agree with the argument that it's all a tier 1 deck. But I think this is, again, a very interesting meta. It's always interesting when you have more tier 1 decks than tier 2 decks, but I genu genuinely do think this is where uh, everything ends up falling. So these are the top 50 decks for Master Duel. There they are. Hope you all enjoyed this tier list video. Let's go ahead and move now to our outro. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this video. Thank you for watching it all the way to the very end. That means a whole lot to me, and it's also a fantastic way to support the channel. And if you're interested in supporting the channel in other ways besides YouTube, there are plenty of ways to do that. If you check out the description below, you'll find a bunch of links down there. One of them goes to my Patreon. You're actually seeing the names of everyone subscribed to the Patreon on the screen right now. So if you're interested in getting your name in the credits here at the end, if you want to see more daily Master Duel content, or if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one private coaching sessions, I offer 
offer all of that on Patreon. I also stream live on Twitch. Feel free to go ahead and click that link and follow and or subscribe there. I also have the Discord community if you want to follow that link where hundreds of duelists have already signed up. Free to join and you can just come hang out, talk about the game, and chill in general. The final link that's going to be in the description is my Twitter. You can follow that if you want some more notifications of what's happening with the channel. So, all in all, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you have a fantastic day.